Phillips, you're one smart son of a bitch. <laughs> Bill's big head is filled, not just with facts, but with mem memories of all the senses. His prose tells us this. The third thing I want to say is what a role model he is. A writer who reminds us by example to not just write, but to live. For me, he is in a clan of writers like Harrison, McGuane, Terry, Doug Peacock, Stegner, and that he has lived a full life of reckless balance, yawing with joy and intensity and forethought across boundaries. Academia, agriculture, fiction, nonfiction, golf, river running, political advocacy. He has refused to accept a dwindling world. Our stories matter, he tells us. It is a simple truth, but a deep one. A truth he has impressed upon not just writers in the West, but all its residents. More than anyone, as much as Wallace Stegner, he has helped convince us that we are building something, and that how we behave and the choices we make have profound meaning, that we still get to make our stories. About his notion of balance, we would be remiss if we didn't mention Onik. In Missoula particularly, there are some chronicles of Wild Bill, but I never knew that man. When I was a freshman in Utah, straight out of a public high school in Houston that had specialized in football, I spent half a quarter in my freshman short story appreciation class listening to my professor extol the virtues of a writer I'd never heard of before, Flo Bear, whom I imagined to be some grand Native American chief, a huge or perhaps Shoshone. <laughs> I like to think that someday a freshman will hear of a revered personage known orally by the last name of Onik as in Bill N. Onik. Bill and Onik. I know we're all individuals, but I can't help it. Much of what they have built in the West, they built together. They are in this together. Here, too, they have provided a model for many. The fourth or maybe fifth thing. Back before it was commonly accepted, Bill was diligent in reminding us that we're guests, and perhaps brief ones, and that our residency in this country is tainted by a stain that at least rivals the slave trade. We took the land from someone else, he reminds us, and writes, we tried to ignore a genocidal history of violence against the Native Americans. These are not the words of a man overly preoccupied with the bestseller lists. Maybe this is the fifth thing. Let's remember that he's not just a great thinker and a great teacher, but also, first and last, a great writer. His lyricism, voice, and sensibility is his own and hard-earned, though at times for me reminiscent of another independent writer shaped by agriculture and the arid west, the great Texas writer John Graves. Bill writes, Never again in my lifetime will it be possible for a child to stand out on a bright spring morning in Warner Valley and watch the water birds come through in enormous rafting V-shaped flocks of thousands, and I grieve. These things, the water birds and their immense V-shaped flocks and countless other treasures previously taken for granted by white Westerners are going away now, are gone, and Kittredge, as much as any Western writer, has had a ringside seat for their going away. The myth of agricultural ownership, like so many other myths, was just flat wrong from the beginning, he tells us. The truth is, he writes, we never owned all the land and water. We don't even own very much of them privately. And we don't own anything absolutely or forever. Listen carefully to Bill's advice from the next rodeo. Love life. Maintain patience and strength of will while attempting generosity. Attempting generosity. As with compassion, it sounds like an easy enough thing, but as ever, the worst myth's choices carry subtle complex meanings. In the time of a burning earth, when increasingly it is every man and woman for himself, the life of Bill, of Bill in Onik, shows us a way through the fire. Montana and the West is most grateful. Bill has a favorite story about Hemingway in Paris. Someone once saw the old man walking down the street and called out from the balcony, Maestro. The street was crowded, but Hemingway didn't even look up, just raised his fist in acknowledgement and kept on walking. 